Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this edition of The Inside on Equinox Television, broadcasting from Cameroon's Economic Hub to Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In this edition of the program, we are going to take an in-depth look at the education of pupils and students in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, or children in those regions in general in relation to the socio-political and security tensions reigning there. The 2020-2021 academic year is already on the way, but there are still many children who are not going to school and administrative authorities, elites have been striving to ensure that the right of uh, education, the right to education of the children of the crisis hit regions and not uh, violated or is not violated and we we'll also talk about the impact of the anglophone crisis on development has been a serious hindrance to development efforts in those two regions for the past close to four years stay with us and meet our guest in some few seconds Our guest in this edition of the program is the Secretary of State in the Ministry of Mines, Industries and Technological Development, Dr. Fu Kalistos Gentry. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. All right, we begin with the northwest region of the country and the northwest and the southwest regions where a crisis has been pulling on for close to four years today. And in 2019, uh, when the crisis uh, was growing in intensity, uh, you urged parents in the Donga Mantum Division and by extension the northwest and the southwest regions of the country to send their children to school, to brief the odds, to brief the security, the fear, and send their children to school. That year went through, another academic year has come. What is your take about the ongoing academic year, how it has started in those two regions? Have you seen that? Uh, has there been any change, any positive change? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, four years on, we have been vindicated. It's right. It was a wrong decision. And those places where school went on have a bonus to prove. Uh, nobody should uh, go. It's a delicate sector. You don't go to places which are the pillars of society. Education, learning, knowledge is a pillar of society. Uh, let me just say, the French uh, writer, Victor Hugo, he says, he who ever opens a school door closes a prison. So we cannot tamper with education, whatever the level of conflict. Even in war uh, time, schools are protected. So I think we give advice. We are very proud that the people of Donga Mantong, a large part of the division, uh, especially Kambe Misaje, heeded to this advice. And um, for four years, they didn't interrupt uh, uh, the school process there. And, and I think today we saw GC, the road, and I think they have a lot to be proud. The advice was genuine, it was pertinent, and I think uh, the rest of the people are following. We've seen that even uh, uh, in the northwest and southwest in general, there was a general euphoria to go back to school. So we believe that uh, our initial advice was genuine and time has proven that uh, we were right. The advice was genuine. Uh, from what you're saying, uh, it can be concluded that there has been a positive change as far as the number of children who are going to school from last year or from 2016 when the crisis started right up to this moment. But there are still several parts of the two Anglophone regions where um, children are not going to school. The school doors are still closed uh, and the situation is still quite uh, disturbing as far as the security of the children is concerned and when you were speaking to the people of Donga Mantum in 2019 you were also assuring them of government's provide for the children 
relatively, uh, you've said it yourself, things have improved. Things have improved. Uh, if you do a statistical analysis, you see that uh, we have uh, percentages that are exponential in terms of how people have responded. I think you go to many places, uh, uh, the dichotomy in this was that many people at first did not want the security. They wanted the security out of the region. And again, we said, no, this security is there uh, to protect you. Its very presence will deter those who come to create problems. And I think when people started being cooperative, welcoming the presence of the army as friends, not as fools, then that kind of synergy was created. And I, th I tell you the truth, if you have uh, an army post somewhere, a gendarmerie post somewhere, uh, whoever wants to create trouble is going to be afraid. So that problem, it took time for the population to understand that the presence of the military was for their interests. And as the, the population welcome and embrace the idea, we have had stability in many places. And those are the places where you can see uh, all is working well. So, but generally, I think uh, the measures on the ground speak for themselves. And I, I like to insist that there's an exponential increase compared to 2016 to 2017. There's an exponential increase in those who are now going to school. Mm. Well, what would you tell those who are still uh, like pessimistic, those who are still doubting, those who are still uh, like pessimistic, those who are still doubting the security which you're talking about, those who are still seeing the military as a threat, those who are still thinking that the presence of the military is going to invite uh, gone batters and they may, call, they may be caught in the crossfire, their children may be caught in the crossfire uh, and things like that. On the contrary, uh, the, 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 the reasoning has turned 180 degrees. People were calling for the military to leave the region. But today, many places are crying and say, look, we need a military post here. We need the military post here in order for schools to start. So what I'm saying, and I... I I was just saying, we, we are doing promotional things, civil society, many elites are putting up programs in their different divisions, uh, parliamentarians are doing things, there are scholarships programs, but all this adds up to the point that security is a main uh, stake, and the only person in a nation that can provide security is the security forces. We don't have alternate security forces, and it's a government responsibility to protect its citizens and the government to do this effectively need a collaboration of the populations. As the population get more to understand this, we are seeing it work. And by the way, uh, he who loses a year is losing a very good part of his life, his destiny. And to, for those who lost four years and for those who went to school in four years, there's a difference which is vast for four years. And I think many people are coming to uh, uh, terms with the reality that whether you like it or not, they will go back to school. So he who is going to school now is a the gainer. In the, whole in the other parts of the two Anglophone regions of the country, uh, we have been seeing you and uh, other elite like Honorable Bengala Gerard yes, yes. in Kambe, in the rest of the Donga Mantum Division yeah. uh, carrying out some field work and uh, that partly accounts for uh, the, the, the difference that Ndonga Mantum, or Nkambe in particular, is making from the rest of the two Anglophone regions I in general, because Ndonga Mantum uh, has been uh, relatively calm yeah. and with many more pupils and students going to school, except for some places like Benakuma in Menchum Valley, which is not far from the Ndonga Mantum Division, yeah. where things are still quite tough there. Mm -hmm. uh, what explains the fact that what you people are doing in Ndonga Mantum, or in Kambe in particular, is not being done in many parts of the two Anglophone regions by the other uh, elites 
and so on. We see more of administrative authorities, DOs, yeah. and sometimes SDOs on the ground, uh, trying to sensitize, trying to encourage parents to send their children to school and ensuring the people of security and so on. Yeah, I must say that uh, it's just a number of factors have played very well in the favor of Dongamanto, that there has been this synergy of all the elite, whether you see them on the field or not, people are doing a lot in the background. Uh, traditional rulers, very important. The administration in Dongamato is genuine. And if the administration works independent of the elite, the result is not as good. But we all work as a synergy. Each elite going down there works with the administration. When we are not there, the administration is in contact with us. We are putting all the programs. Each person does it in his own way in order to, but it's all that mosaic of activities that build up the picture that we are putting. We, th I think naturally we have this threat that we have a very long porous border with Nigeria. And when we don't secure our children, they have a very good excuse to cross over and go to Nigeria and, you know, define it there. So we have a restraining factor to contain our children. And we've always done it. So when this came, the, the urgency and need for it became more than ever. And I want to take the opportunity to say that um, so many elite, many have done many things. Some organized football uh, tournaments. All the social activities uh, have met and restrained many uh, youths. And I want to say that Tonga Manto is a place where internally displaced people from other divisions are present in, in our different scheme, even in our scholarship program in one subdivision, the, the first prize for GC went to somebody from the division. So we are accommodating. We have made an, an enabling environment, not only for the people of Dongamanto, but for people from other divisions. Honorable Benga, Gerard was telling me in the 6 p.m. news uh, earlier this week that the number of pupils and students has tremendously increased in yeah. Dongamantum as a result of the influx from pe of people from other neighboring uh, divisions and, and so on. And there's uh, going to be a problem of infrastructure at the level of the schools yeah. with the restrictions of the COVID-19 and all of that. How are you uh, managing that or helping the people who are on the ground, the actors, the educational stakeholders who are on the ground? to manage this? Yes, w in fact, we have a lot of uh, uh, schemes that are in place. Uh, we believe that uh, in some places, some students uh, left. That has created room for others to come in. And uh, uh, we have created, uh, where we have an influx, I can assure you, the mayors, the education family, and the administration. We are looking for children who over these years have lost a lot of time that they ought to have been four classes ahead. You can be assured that uh, we are taking measures. Uh, there are programs even in secondary education to construct uh, new uh, infrastructure in different places. There is a reconstruction uh, project of uh, the Northwest and South. It's very active. Uh, all these are meant to make sure that they will accommodate uh, all the uh, deficits that uh, uh, will be created. But a division like us, which I'm happy you bring this up, should be looked at as a place which is uh, an enabling environment. Like, While, a, like a buffer zone? Uh, yes. Sort of like a buffer yeah, zone. And we are very welcoming. And I, I tell you, we, when we say there's a scholarship scheme, the first is from any division. We, in, even in a, a scheme, the scholarship scheme, when we first, part of it was about helping those who had lost a parent. And we didn't look at people in Donga Manto. If an army, anybody from littoral, anywhere who was in the division uh, had that criteria, we do not discriminate. We welcome everybody into Donga Manto, and it's our pride. And our whole point is that all the efforts the elite put, we want other divisions to emulate and copy what we do. And if we liberate, like now, and I can assure you, 
for what I've, uh, I can give you statistics of today. We started in Misaje, Ako, Kambi. Uh, schools have started in, in, in all the subdivisions of Misaje. I'm very pr uh, of uh, Donga Manto. I'm very proud to say that. And even in places like Misaje, I can show you all the schools, including Lamy schools, are open. So those places like Dunga, uh, Ako, which were not as uh, involved like Kambi and Misaje. I can assure you that now all the subdivisions in Donga Manto, as we are going around with our, the scholarship program, uh, schools have started in all the subdivisions. Schools are operational in okay. Donga Manto, yes. and uh, the parents who are sending their children to school, many of them will certainly be having some uh, doubts in their mind as to the security of the children. Mm. Many of them will still be seen, but God protect this my children. Yeah. Because anything can happen at any time. Yeah. Bullet can come from anywhere yeah. at any time and picks up my yes. child and so on. So what are you telling them to like some sort of a guarantee that your children will be going to school from the beginning to the end of the academic year? Mm and they will come back alive. Uh, Mr. Bella, this is, we, I come back to what I said. There was a kind of misunderstanding at the beginning where the population was very apprehensive of the presence of the military. Uh, today in Ako, we have quite a good military presence. Today in Du subdivision in Gabo, we have a military presence. Today, that is a deterrent. And the presence alone is reassuring. But not just for students, for everybody. And that, to me, is, is, is what you need when you have a, a kind of anarchy that, that tries to reign in a place. The military presence is to make sure that children's security is guaranteed in schools. And this is what those places which were a bit remote, like Ako, like Moa, like uh, when you are going down to... Bobplane and Gabo, they have all been uh, given the adequate security. And this security is not just for school reopening, it's going to be there to make sure that normalcy returns to the division, to the region at large. Security around the schools. Security not around the schools, security in the, in the subdivisions. In the subdivisions. Yes. Uh, I was going to put myself in the shoe of a parent. Yeah. And I'm looking at my daughter, I'm looking at my son. He lives from the house, mm. and from the house to the school, probably there's no military post. Mm. Maybe the military, the soldiers are parading around, yeah. checking to see that there's no uh, threat coming from anywhere. Mm. But they will not be there all the time no, between yeah. the school and the house. Yes. The, the, and the, the, the house when the child is sleeping and all of that. Again, this is a point. The presence of the military in a subdivision is a deterrent to troublemakers. So that alone started before schools reopened. And in many places, there is, there is no trouble. That's why children, parents are sending their children to school. They are not experimenting with the lives of their children. There has been calm in Ako for the past month, for the past two months. And this has given assurance to parents that government has prepared the ground security-wise. So it's not like today uh, there's a few soldiers that have come to see their children go to school. No. We have prepared the ground. Two months, three months, we made all. It didn't start today. We could go and clean schools because they were in the boat. But the groundwork for security has been going on since three months and it's bearing its fruit now. Th there seems to be a very strong synergy yeah. between inhabitants of the Dongamantum division. There seems to be a, a, a wall, a barrier that has been raised by the people mm. to hinder any intruder coming from elsewhere mm. to bring some kind of trouble. Yes. How did you achieve that? Let me, let, that is a very good question. Uh, let me give uh, the case of Bisaje, for example. You see, if people in a locality do not entertain people who are troublemakers in their area, 
anarchy will not take root. That means it is only when people welcome uh, troublemakers that they fuse with them to create more trouble. So what we did initially was that when we had a few people, we created very, very genuine vigilante groups. The funds decreed, spoke to the people. If you get into this, human life will be lost, blood will be shed. And we preached the message. And it was a simple message. Do not allow your children to get into this because it's not a profitable exercise. Once we restrain the children from welcoming people who came from other places to create trouble, they could not find roots in those places. And that's how we kept it. <clears throat> so the vigilante groups, the traditional rulers, uh, the support from elite, and all that kept the population. You could be able to know that this guy is not from here. He's come here. What is So everybody becomes everybody's keeper. And that was genuine. And it was done with a good basic education. And then the military presence came to reinforce isolated incidents. And I think that's the genesis of the success of places like Kambe and Misaje, which now we're expanding to Ako, Mwa. Away from and Kambe do. and Misaje, there is still some sort of uh, an atmosphere of uncertainty and threat looming over the people away from these two uh, uh, places, Kambe in particular. No, I just, I just said to you uh, that, uh, you see, if children, you see uh, uh, from we were in Ako uh, on Thursday to give uh, prizes to students who you, you saw crowds of students. This did not happen last year. There has been preparation on the security front for the past three months. So if you go to do uh, like today, uh, they were in Tumbo, there is general euphoria to get back to school. You go to more schools have started. This is what the government has been doing to create an enabling environment, which probably was not as highly uh, motivated as in, in, in Cambria and Misaje, but this is taking root everywhere. So these ingredients have to go together. Security, the will of the people to allow their children away from these activities, and of course, the vigilante groups which make sure that human life is precious, we ought to, in every respect, preserve it. Has Ngarbu been uh, freed from the scars of the last tragic incident that occurred there? Uh, listen, Mr. Babila, that brings me to the point. When we talk of schemes that we are putting in place, whether it's scholarships, whether it's going down to meet people, it's not just about gifts. It's not just about presence. It's not just about assistance. It's about taking away these cars. It's psychological. Because people are going to live with these things for quite some time. You can't erase it in three months, in six months. That's why, uh, like, my scholarship scheme is for a three-year period. It's not a thing you're going to do and say, okay, children have gone back to school. You need to bring back the love for education. You need to bring back the love of living together. You need to bring back the take out the fear in people and that's why all these elements those divisions which will work hard to welcome the reconstruction process are going to again take a step before the others Senator Mbela Mukichas said reconstruction should start in the mines the that's mines it. should be reconstructed first that's it and I, I'm, I'm, I happen to be a member of the National Steering Committee for Recon Reconstruction. Now, when we say chiefs should go back, when we say cultural activities should start, these things are the fabric. The guy in the village is used to his Njangi group and the rest of it. When these things s are restored and the rest of it, the, the, the psychological effect and impact of this is going to start dissipating. And this is not going to happen in a day. We are going to live with it, but the reconstruction process 
start first with these social activities to get people, to get funds back, to get palaces functioning, to get traditional authority reinstituted. And then the rest will follow. People's minds will be built. Mm, but, but there are some um, politicians, human rights activists who think that uh, reconstructing people's minds, getting people rid of this gas, of some of the horrible things that they have seen, they have experienced, they have heard happen and they have seen happening around them, justice should come first. Mm. Justice should come first. What do you think about that? You see, you cannot draw distinct lines. There should be a synergy of things happening. Reconstruction is not like Oh, we have to go and start building a school here, as we have said, me and you saying the same thing. Is that it's a process. You need to start with some activities that might not be visible, which are mind-changing. So you can't say, let's finish with all the justice. Let's finish with, let there be total peace and nobody is afraid. Then reconstruction will come. That is very ideological. It's not practical in the real world. What under reconstruction can you start inserting? You are going to uh, draw a chronogram. This is what can be done here. This can be possible in Donga Manto, but it might not be possible in Momo. You are going to give each person to examine its case as a peculiarity. And I think that is the beauty of the reconstruction process. Anytime the National Steering Committee meets, the regional steering committees follow up immediately. And then mayors have been called. They are now working on some things. They are working on small things about maybe compensating people who were so, so desperate. Or, there's so much happening. Let's leave it to them. These are trained people supported by experts who are supporting this program, who have faced similar things in different countries of the world. And experts of the United Nations exactly. Development Program exactly. uh, say that... Uh, the three-year recovery uh, program, which is part of the global reconstruction and development uh, program, mm. will start from blue zones, what they consider as blue zones, yeah. and then from there it will be progressively moving to other parts of the... the, 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 the two I, I get a lot of calls from my mayors in Donga Manton telling me what they are doing, uh, which small aspect they are doing, reporting back to the regional committee. but. There were those who said, you can't talk of reconstruction until the crisis is over. Now, that is ideological. You, you, you need to weave in things. Life is not about walls. It's not concrete and mortar. You have to be malleable. And I think that those people who will embrace these ideas, like those who have embraced the idea of saying, oh, look, guys, this thing is not a good thing. Uh, this, is not, this is not the right way. Is this is going to lead to death. This is going to lead to God. The, those societies have less casualties. Yes, what you're saying is uh, uh, equal to what um, Minister Paul Tasson said during his tour of the two regions with regards to the reconstruction. He said that the reconstruction will fast track the return to peace and normalcy. But this is seen as putting the cart before the horse. Yes. Well, I, I, I beg to differ, you know, that a proverb, what you're saying, putting a card before, is a proverb. A proverb is not a, a resolute promise. A proverb has many exceptions. So there are many exceptions to every proverb that you say. But what we are seeing here is a practical case of things that can be done of blue zones that are available. There are places where the cart is not before the horse. <laughs> there are places where the horse is before the cart. But at the end of the day, we need to be experimenting and moving on. We can't fold our hands and wait and say one day, well, when it's all set, no. What we're saying is, let us get, we are dealing with experts. We are dealing with places where even when the war is on, there are actions that are being done to ameliorate the lives of people. What's wrong? 
if people's lives are being ameliorated uh, and made sure that somebody who lost his house is able to get a place to stay, is that a bad thing? I don't think so. Well, that is what some government critics um, qualify as cosmetic solutions. That is uh, trying to reconstruct when there is still war, uh, sensitizing the people on the importance of education, telling mothers and fathers send your children to school, government is going to protect you, bring in scholarship, while the real problem is still there the unsolved. The what do you tell those people who qualify all oh, what you're doing as a cosmetic, oh, yes, cosmetic I find solutions? It. Look, you see, society, a state, is about the opinion of everybody. And this country allows the opinion of everybody. But if the leader synthesizes the opinion of everybody, and don't think that he doesn't take in account what the critics say, but if you were to be skewed in your thinking, to listen to the opinion of one person, a nation will not work. So all these views are taken into account, but what is practical? Before the national dialogue, everybody said, look, this is not possible, it should be this. It was a step in the right direction. Even the critics will acknowledge it now. You can't be in the middle of a crisis, you need to do something to hear what everybody thinks about this. Yes, you could as well stay for two years to plan this wonderful dialogue where you will but what do you do in that time? We did something. Everybody in society was represented. The civil society, the opposition, everybody that mattered in this country was invited. And the format in which it, it went on might not be the same like what everybody wanted, but it has to go on. Everybody was invited, except those who were at the center of the problem. The yes. secessionist leaders who, yes, were, who were not there in the United States, yes, in Germany. Yes, but we, and those invitations were extended. And they, they, as far as they were concerned, some of them thought that uh, their security was not guaranteed. What else do you say to somebody who, to whom you invite? Uh, they should look at the government of this country as being responsible. If I invite you for a meeting, it means that your security is guaranteed. And we, it was not done under the table. They are priests, they are people, the civil society. So I think it was a lost opportunity. But to be fair and honest, there was invitations to everybody. And I think many people came from the diaspora. Those who thought that uh, they, they are those who wanted a third party. Can we not sit in this country and solve problems between ourselves? Some, they, some thought that there must be this third party before they will come. That was their opinion. But what do we do when there are so many views we have to factor in somewhere and start? And I think it wasn't a bad idea. My point is it was a step in the right direction. It was a step in the right direction to some uh, people like Barista Ashu Emanuel Abo, uh, Barista Tamfu Richard will ask, but if Phil Marshall leaves, the PLM and comes to Yaoundé for national dialogue. Yeah. And at the end of the day, no agreement. Will he be allowed to go back to the bush? Well, if Mark Barika comes in the, to the, take part in the dialogue, and at the end of the day, no agreement, will he, have a, will he be allowed to go back to the U.S.? The, the, the barrister boss will always be there. The government bench will always be there. That is what makes society... The diversity of our ideas is what makes us a great people. But what people forget is that as they have the ideas, there's a whole plethora of ideas. That was one. There could have been 12 different opinions. And the idea might not come in holistic, but I bet you most of the time the leader might take a bit, not all of your idea and factor into what happened in the national Well, area. others th are thinking that uh, there should be a third party and that such meeting should take place on a neutral ground, maybe out of Cameroon. I understand that from your point of view, Cameroonians can sit together in their own country and solve their problems. That's it. That's what you're saying. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a look at what the newspapers reported this week. In the post, bishops of the Bamenda ecclesiastical province warn that the worst may still be heard if the Anglophone crisis is not solved quickly. 
The voice looks down into 1,000 days of the struggle to restore the independence of former British Southern Cameroons. According to the Guardian Post, school resumption for the 2020-2021 academic year registered a remarkable improvement in the crisis hit northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon. In the same vein, The Voice highlights back-to-school efforts of some elites reporting that Dr. Fu Kalithu Stentry, elite of the Dongamantum Division and Secretary of State in the Ministry of Mines, Industries and Technological Development, was canonized by parents, teachers, students, pupils and local administrators of Misaji Subdivision during a scholarship award ceremony. The Horizon projects another elite of the same area, Honorable Ngala Gerard, who also went championing effective back to school. The paper exclaims over the failure of a petition to ban Cameroon's head of state Paul Beer from Switzerland. Another issue of the Guardian Post reports lamentations of the senior associate for Africa and regional director at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, Dr. Christopher Formunia, over what he qualifies as the death of democracy in Africa. The Sun reports the death of Cameroon's Bar Council president, Barista Charles Chakunte Pati, described by the Guardian Post as a calamity. As reported by the Post Weekender, power changes hands at the helm of palm oil plantations from His Majesty Mekanya Okon Charles to Tapian Bile, former technical director of the Cameroon Development Corporation, CDC. The star details the final verdict of elections Cameroon on the December 6 regional elections. 95 party lists and 102 lists of traditional rulers retained. The sun shines on Limbe, winner of the 2020 Cleanest City competition. And the advocate writes that Limbe wins big as Limbe 1 subdivision got the first prize ahead of Douala 2 and Yaoundé 5 council areas. Thanks for staying with us. We are still with our guest, Dr. Fukalistos Gentry, Secretary of State in the Ministry of Mines, Industries and Technological Development. He thinks that the current decentralization code being implemented with the special status for the Northwest and the Southwest regions and the upcoming regional elections, uh, all of these should constitute a springboard, a starting point to the solution, to a sustainable solution to the crisis in the northwest and southwest regions of the country. Other people are thinking that all these cannot work, but you are thinking that it's going to work. Can you tell us why? Yes. And how it's going to work? It's going to work because uh, Mr. Babila, the councils are working. It's going to work because the central government here is working. But in the middle, there is a vacuum. There is a regional uh, structure that is better placed than me sitting here in Yaoundé to rush to Bamenda over a weekend and think that I can solve the crisis. These people are people who have held very powerful positions in this country. They understand how this country works. They are general managers, they are former members of government, they are civil society leaders, and they will be based in Bamenda. They will look at these things. They will have the ability to talk to these people, look at the problem. They are going to come from every subdivision. They have lived their experience in their different places. A congregation of these people at the regional level. By the way, this problem is not a subdivisional problem. It's not a divisional problem. It's a problem that involves two regions. And you can only look at it by creating a plethora of ideas, people, different experiences at the regional level. And by the way, there are going to be people, commissioners, especially in the case of the regional assemblies peculiar to the Northwest and Southwest, who will go into different aspects of society. And I bet you, those guys will be having the rank of members of government at the region. They will have more contact and understanding with the people of the Northwest or the Southwest than those who are in the central government. 
what is wrong with this? That is a point to start. In Nigeria, in the federalism which everybody wants, the, the structure is at the state level. States, regions, in France, and I mean, in, in England, it's Scotland devolved and all this. It must be sent away from the center. So what is wrong with that? If you can work at the council level, why can you not work at the regional level? The councils are functioning. Everybody believes that we should transfer money to the councils. But you need greater expertise. You need members. You know, in many of these regions, I want you to just look at the composition of those who are going to make up these assemblies. They are very, very, they are businessmen, all walks of life. They are better place than the councillors we select in Bali or in Misaje or in Mundemba. They, they, they master society more. I think that they will bring in a lot of experience which will, will make the councils work better, which will consider aspects affecting the region as a whole. So why leave a vacuum in the middle? Why not fill it and make it better with time? I don't understand. The major national dialogue came and passed the recommendations. Some of the key recommendations have been in the process of implementation for more than a year today. In the meantime, violence has continued, killings have continued, abductions, destruction of properties continuing, the general atmosphere of uncertainty is still raining one year down memory lane after these things which you're talking about were announced so what has changed and what how is it going to change you see in science or anything there must be a measuring rod where are we you must speak with relativity violence yes violence does not cease in a day but has violence decreased yes it has that is how we evaluate. You, you, you see, there was uh, nobody could go to Boyo before the national dialogue. But today, we have a different scenario. There can be sporadic events. But overall, has violence increased or has it decreased? You will give me the answer. It has decreased. And that is where we are going to. Violence will decrease. The non-governmental organizations like the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa, like uh, Human Rights Watch and others, Stand Up for Cameroon, will tell you the contrary, will tell you that violence has been increasing. No, no, no. I think they will say there has been a series of uh, horrendous events. They cannot say violence per se about the number of incidents per day has increased. That is, I mean, they are not magicians. We are all living in this country and we know what we are talking about. I can, I can assure you that when you look at life, the very fact that schools have started in Ako, the very fact that schools have started in Bamenda and the rest, shows that there's a net decrease in violence. The government has repositioned itself to come back to the point which I like. We spent quite a good time initially talking about security. The government has mastered the security situation better. And we, before even the dialogue, the president responded to every issue that was asked for in the initial conflict. Society, we have the Vietnam, we have Nasla in Boya, we have, I mean, National dialogue has led so many young people to come out from the bushes. And let me tell you, not all of them go to the DDR centers. Many choose not to go to. The national dialogue, which the prime minister did with mastery. The prime minister went down to the northwest, walked along the streets with people, brought the people to say, look, we, the government is here to listen to you. What can we do? It is a foundation of that that was even for the national dialogue. Militants a lot has changed, uh, a lot. Militants. And we need to, we, we can do statistical analysis. Let's not just listen to what uh, uh, NGOs are saying. We have, we are living in this country. Look, 
It was not possible to leave Douala and go to Boya very easily. Life is returning to normal in many places. Yes, there could be sporadic places where it has not worked out the same. I like your terminology of blue zones and the rest. Yes, there are. But we should say overall, what is a trend? That doesn't mean a conflict doesn't get solved in a day. We every day before the conflict, uh, before the national dialogue, during the national dialogue, the prime minister under the auspices of the president of the republic is working daily to bring normalcy. Maybe the, uh, the reconstruction uh, project is there, is holding, in the regions is holding. How could we say that the national dialogue has not brought? The regional elections are going to take place. Selections have been done. I was How coming can to we that. say militants, that uh, things that were promised in the national dialogue have not been real? Uh, militants, uh, supporters and sympathizers of the Cameroon Renaissance Movement and other Cameroonians took to the streets on the 22nd of September, yeah. protesting against the organization of the regional elections yes. without a sustainable solution to the Anglophone crisis yeah. and without a revision of the uh, electoral code and so on. But you are saying that the regional elections is going to be a door opener, yeah. it's going to open the way for the implementation of the special stages and of course subsequent solutions will be coming up, solutions will be coming up for the Anglophone crisis yes. uh, and so on. So when you uh, look at this squarely, do you think that the stakes of the regional elections are higher than restoring peace and normalcy? Mr. Babel, let me ask you. Uh, I like the hypocrisy that people like the MRC will try to take the Anglophone crisis. And do you believe that people can get up in the United States, those who do not like Donald Trump, for example, and will say, we are going to make sure that Donald Trump, we have elected him, he must. I mean, this doesn't happen in any country. I'm very surprised that, because what I believe in, that in anything we do, we should work in legality. What does the constitution of this country say? One of the things I have a lot of respect for the president of this country is because he respects the constitution. There is nothing that he does which is not within the law. If there is a date that elections must be pronounced, even if it's on the last day, he makes sure that it stays within. Now, under what constitutional provision can somebody come out to say an elected government in which he participated in the election should, you no, know, where we start, where there is no rule, there's anarchy. There is only one thing that guides us in this country, is the condition. Do you believe that the action of the MRC is within the constitutional uh, regulations of this country? I'm not supposed to ask you a question. The, the, consti to, the constitution uh, permits people to protest. Permit people not to, international not to, legal not to protest to bring down governments. That's an insurrection. And let me remind anybody that once somebody is elected, he becomes the president of everybody. He becomes a middle player. He's not a president for CPDM. He becomes a president of MRC. He becomes a president of the SDF. That is, that is what it is. But the law does not forbid uh, protests against yeah, the, the president of the no, republic. No, listen to me. If you go out to protest and say, look, the prices of, uh, you, you see most times in Arab nations, the prices of bread is high in this country. What do we do? It's, it's a right of the people. But if your protest is because you want to bring down a government. There's no constitutional provision for that. As I would say, people should always remember, God says that every authority is instituted by him. When a leader is elected and he takes office, it's because God so wished. My question was more focused on the stakes of the regional elections. What are the stakes of the regional elections? Well, I just thought, I just thought that to I just thought because you the brought in, you brought in the MRC and I think that for, for, for all of us, if there is no guideline in what we do, there will be anarchy. The constitutional provision for people to match is there. But what are they matching for? Coming to the regional elections, I want to say that I believe that the stakes, whatever it is, 
we started a process. Senatorial, presidential elections, municipal, parliamentary, we are concluding. Why would somebody come at the last phase of this election and then believe that that's where the process should stop? It should have started with saying that there should be no presidential election. So the, 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 the regional elections is the only way I find that Anglophones should focus in order to make sure that they experiment, put into practice what has been given in order for them to nurture, develop, and see grow their aspirations for their cultural identity. Anybody who believes that it shouldn't start there is not in good faith. We're going to take the interviews of the week now, and when we come back, we'll look at how the Anglophone crisis has seriously hindered development in the two Anglophone or English-speaking regions of the Republic of Cameroon. From assessment in the uh, regional level and Tunisia and Bamenda, just have resumed thanks to the mobilization of the school children, the parents, the teachers, and the special measures taken by the security services to accompany that resumption in the region. I'm also happy that uh, from what we have observed, people, teachers have observed the barrier measures prescribed by the World Health Organization and the government to fight against COVID. We want to sincerely behave, be, believe that this year must be a normal year for the schools. So that's why we invite all the parents to accompany their children to schools. Ngyang is standing up as one person to say they must go to school. If those children don't go to school, there is never a day. We also stand one day and address the population as we are doing today. We learn with much enthusiasm that our effort paid off last year, that the first student in Cameroon for KPM exam came from GTTC Mondemba. Parents of Ndian are financially handicapped. And I am proposing that for this year again, if possible, school fees and PTA fees should be suppressed. I say if possible, school fees and PTA fees. We are also saying that the hierarchy should look on this issue of face mask. We went in for a 100% school resumption. It is true that we have not succeeded to have a 100%, but we are have 90 plus percentage. So in the word zone, just like in the lower board zone, Mayobinga zone, these are zones that uh, have not known school for the past four years. I will tell you that today, schools have effectively resumed in these zones. We have both at the primary level and at the secondary level. My own motor star was down here. We were going to build camp fix the roads now yesterday, but we are not still there. See, so far we did so far we are. We don't make three days before we come up with Mabo Camrish or Camrish on Duya. The transport will come out above some Camrish on Kambe. Now 20 and 25,000. The head of state made the employment a national course and the vocational training a national priority. You welcome back. Now we are talking about how the Anglophone crisis has seriously hindered development in the two English-speaking regions of uh, Cameroon. And a case in point in this edition of The Insight is the Frontier Agricultural and Industrial Program. Uh, FENAP launched on the 4th of November 2015 in the Kambe. Dr. Fukali Gentry, tell us more about this initiative. What has happened to it? Talking about crumbling uh, activities, this is not the only uh, thing that has been crumbled by the crisis. You know, uh, we have so many road projects. We have the, the rain road project where we have funding. We have the Baba Jobamendaro where there's funding and these things cannot go ahead because of the crisis. Uh, talking about the frontier agro uh, industrial uh, 
uh, program is not limited to Donga Mato. It's a program conceived uh, in this ministry which was meant to touch uh, four regions which share boundaries with other countries the Northwest, the Southwest, the East, and the South. And the idea is that if we were going to produce uh, in order to uh, uh, sell to our neighbors, uh, this will become a huge economy because. Uh, we happen to be very blessed with fertile lands, agro-basins and the rest of it. And then we have a giant neighbor uh, with a population of more than 200 million people and so on. So the idea is that we develop uh, dry pots in terms of producing at the frontier so that uh, it crosses over without any much uh, complications in shipping, trade, just something that can be done by the ordinary person. And the idea is to increase production so that what is left of after local consumption can be transformed to add value to it and then uh, sell to our neighbors who are all around us. What has happened to it? Four years of uh, strife means that, uh, in fact, where we started the pilot project, uh, the secessionist uh, even place their camp there and uh, uh, most of the equipment, most of the things were taken away. Most of what was already stopped, but not, it's not a problem. We are patient. We know that normalcy will come. We know that with reconstruction, we are advancing some of these ideas, even in the reconstruction uh, uh, program. And we believe that this is, this is what part of the history of this country we are optimistic it's going to pass and we believe that uh, all the good things that the people of this country have planned for each other will come to pass so we just believe that uh, we have to be optimistic that's why i keep saying you can't build walls and say this must end before this starts we just have to keep walking with a lot of wisdom and see what to do at each time and and be flexible and be be, be allow each thing to happen based on the wisdom that will initiate at our different uh, divisions or subdivisions. We are rounding up this edition of the program with um, the problem of illegal mining in Cameroon in an in-depth report by Tembang Solomon last year he showed how illegal particularly illegal Chinese mining has uh, destroyed livelihood and is foiling conflicts in Cameroon. What's the government doing about it? This, yes, uh, again, this is a very good question because it goes back to uh, uh, the regional elections. We have in an article about uh, decentralization. Our ministry is supposed to give out divorce powers to the councils, to the regions, about. Uh, certain activities. Most of the activities you are citing as illegal mining are in the artisanal sector. And these sectors will be divulged to councils to manage. And we believe that uh, when a mayor sees foreigners in his area, is better place to control and take action than the central government sitting in Yaoundé to send directors on the side. These are all the advantages. Uh, we shouldn't just look at regional uh, assemblies in terms of politics. They are practical things that will bring solutions that when each ministry divulges powers to people, they'll be able to handle things like illegal mining, which you are saying. So for now, we have basic texts which regulate. Uh, we started first uh, with going out there to create a kind of uh, composite tax that made sure that everybody who was in an activity was taxed and so on. And then we took a head count of all the people. And then at least now we know that uh, these people are here and we have regularized their activities. But the best of it will be when some of these things, uh, like artisanal mining, are divulged uh, to be managed at the, at the regional level. Maybe you have a specific message that you want to send to the Yes, a specific message the I would... The Southwest regions? Yes, uh, special two messages. First of all, about our scholarship scheme. 
I mean, I say that it's a, uh, a three-year program, which is not just meant to give goodies, money, or assistance to students, but it's meant to build back the psychological fabric of what these children have gone through. Uh, when a child is going to see the senior division officer coming to give him a prize in his school or other elite reaching out to them, they start building back this confidence they have lost. They start uh, taking away this fear. So I believe uh, next year again we'll continue in the same exercises. Even if schools go normal, it's a three-year program that is meant to rehabilitate the minds of people. For the Northwest and Southwest regions, I, I want to say uh, specifically that they should take the challenge of making the regions work. The regions, those who say that the status is uh, not special, uh, they should understand that in every nation in the world, whether it's federalism, whether it's decentralization, it has its own peculiarities in the nature of each nation. In Nigeria is different, in the United States is different, in England is different, in Cameroon it has to be different. It evolves, it changes, it is tested, ingredients are added. So we have a regalian duty to make sure that these regions are put in place. The nostalgia that we have for promoting our cultural identity, for doing things with living a lot, like our traditional rulers, our values, system, and the rest, will be tested by us. So for those who look at it as some kind of uh, cosmetic, no, that is not true. It's genuine, and I, I want that the Northwest and Southwest should give this a chance, develop it, and make it work. Dr. Fu Kalistos Gentry, Secretary of State in the Ministry of Mines, Industries and Technological Development. Thank you for accepting to be our guest in this edition of The Insight. I want to thank you very much uh, for taking our own viewpoints uh, in your most uh, recognized news media. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for this edition of The Insight. Goodbye.